welcome, welcome to another Open Dialogue webinar. We're here with CarStar Canada today. We've got Brad Green, the Director of Operations and Performance Management for CarStar Radar Group. How are you doing today, Brad? Doing great. Thanks for having me. Awesome. And then we've got Dave Foster, the Senior Vice President of Operations and Development for CarStar Canada here as well. How are you today, Dave? Excellent. Thanks, Allison. Perfect. Perfect. Yep. So we're going to be talking about the big picture. That's our theme for today. So it's a big theme, as in the name. So uh, we're going to be talking about growing your single store into a profitable company. Brad has lots of experience in doing that himself. And then we've got Dave here, who's seen it happen times and times over with uh, CarStar Canada, going to be uh, picking Brad's brain here for his uh, tips and advice. The really big themes we're going to be focusing on today, um, enhancing performance, maximizing profitability, driving growth, uh, and then we're going to be discussing the resources to get you there, you know, like elite performance groups, all of the different uh, pillars of the Car Star strategy and what's worked for their teams. So without further ado, I'll just uh, say thank you to our speakers for being here and Brad and Dave, why don't you take it away and let the crowd know a little bit about your history in the industry and um, tell us uh, about our topic today. Go ahead, Brad, you first. Okay, well, uh, Brad Green, uh, uh, Director of Operations for the Radar Collision Group. I've uh, been in the industry about 25-ish uh, years, give or take. Uh, started out much like many people do uh, at the beginning, washing cars in a shop. Um, realized pretty quickly that I was much better with people than I was with cars and slowly transitioned into an administrative role. Uh, and I've spent the last uh, 20 or so years uh, Learning as much as I can, uh, worked with a number of MSOs, network net networks um, prior to, to joining Radar Group. Uh, and then the last five or six years, we've been uh, we've been working really hard, uh, trying to grow to grow our, our group uh, effectively. And um, so far, it seems to be working out. We do have some strategies we'll discuss uh, that have that have been a, a great benefit to us um, as we have we scaled our business. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to represent the Radar Group and uh, CarStar, and I uh, really look forward to bringing some value to you guys. Thanks, Brad. Yeah, Dave Foster here. Uh, I I come from a different, you know, a different place. I'm not from the industry originally. My background was in uh, I was a licensed tool and die maker. Um, I also went to school for mechanical engineering, so I come from the automation world where I was design and build automated automated equipment for the automotive industry from the manufacturing side. Um, I did that for, you know, 10 years or so. And then I got out of that business and went into the sales side of that, of that uh, segment and enjoyed that for quite some time. And then, um, I had an opportunity to get into the collision space working for one of the paint companies. And that was about 12 years ago, uh, built great relationships in the industry over the years, learned a lot about process and operations and took my mindset and my knowledge and experience from the uh, automotive manufacturing sector and brought it with me. Um, I then built relationships with the folks at CarStar about nine years ago, eight and a half, nine years ago, and had the great opportunity to join CarStar in the capacity of Director of Franchise Development in Canada. Uh, as anything happens, you know, like anything happens with German brands, things move fast. Um, and so does your career when you're on that fast track. So I had great opportunities inside of Driven, and I expanded into North American roles in franchise development, got into some, you know, a little bit of uh, strategy and M&A work um, during the acquisitions of, of, of Uniglass and Fix Auto US. And then I was given a great opportunity to oversee all the corporate stores. We had 20 corporate stores in the US, 10 in Seattle, 10 in uh, Southern California, and, uh, and three in Canada. That was probably one of the best learning grounds for me for about three years where I learned, you know, what it felt like to be an owner, all the struggles that goes that goes through um, the day-to-day -day experience with an ownership and, and dealing with insurance companies, dealing with people, um, dealing with uh, technicians and front to back. And it was an amazing experience. And then um, about two years ago, I was, I was asked to come back into Canada and oversee operations and development. And it's been great to be back in Canada, working with the team here. Uh, obviously it's where my heart is and where, where I was brought up and, and truly really is, 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 a, is a passion and a love for me. So I'm thrilled to be here with Brad uh, talking about some of the experiences and uh, looking forward to sharing more. So let's talk a little bit about CarStar, the, the history, uh, where it started 30 years ago, where it's our 30th anniversary um, in Canada. Uh, we have about uh, 315 stores nationwide, 201 owners. You know, it's the it's largest North the North America's largest multi-operator network of independent-owned collision repair centers. 
So that's that's pretty cool. Um, we have about 400 in the U.S. as well. So we're doing really good down there. Um, you know, if I look at Car Start today versus where it was 30 years ago when, you know, Sam Mercanti brought it into Canada, um, we're coming back to that training and education piece, right? We have to train our people. We have to train our people to be prepared to drive performance. And the performance will drive profitability and profitability will drive growth. And you're going to hear that theme over and over again today, I think, between Brad and I talking. But uh, Car Start is in a great spot. Uh, we have a, um, a great opportunity to continue to grow our network across the country with the fantastic owners and um, and communities that we serve. And as we all know, um, our industry is is it moves at, at a speed that some of us can't quite comprehend. You know, the, the advancements in technology inside the cars um, and how that affects the repair technology. And then we have our workforce course, right? We know our workforce is aging out. We have to always think ahead. We have to always think about how we stay ahead of technology, how we always stay ahead of the repair technology, but how do we stay ahead of hiring and building people and building culture? Because um, without people, we really have nothing, right? So our stores can't repair vehicles without trained technicians or good quality people and good, good culture in our stores. So it's going to be a major focus, never mind for car start or for Brad and his stores, but for everybody in our industry. And we all have to collectively come together to fix this problem of getting more people into our industry. Yeah, and Dave, I think that's a, that's a good point. Is you know something that our industry maybe doesn't give itself enough credit for is our adaptability, our ability to to face the challenges of uh, ongoing technology and uh, the sophistication of repairs, changes in uh, changes even in the customer bases. But we have to recognize that perhaps we haven't necessarily changed. Our, our environments or, or been as flexible in understanding that we need to create a better place for people to want to come work for us. The, yeah. the foundation of success really in any business needs to be the culture of your team. There's a lot of reasons. There's a lot of reasons for that. But, you know, effectively what I see is some very well-run shops that miss the mark on the environment and the culture piece. So, you know, we can't just focus on, are we fixing cars correctly are we are we profitable? That's obviously very important, but equally important, if not more important, for the true sustainability of your business, is are you creating an environment where people are seen and heard, and there's open lines of communication? Is there diversity in thought, diversity in culture? You know, those are things that we put a lot of focus on. Uh, our strategy has been from the beginning uh, to focus on culture. We knew that if we built a strong culture that effectively that would continue to drive growth. That would be the foundation of our success. And uh, and and it's proven to be the right path for us. So, um, you know, it, it it really is important that we that we take the same approach that we do on the technical side with understanding that what we did 10, 15, 20 years ago, obviously is not what we do now. And it's exactly the same environment for how we treat our people, how we deliver messages, how do we recognize talent, and how do we build strong culture? It's exactly the same. Yeah, so true, Brad. I mean, I was reading something today, actually, where they were talking about what the workforce today wants from their employer. And it's not a dollar here or 10 cents there or, or things of that nature. They want to see a, a, a sight line to their career path. They want to see that they go to a place that cares about them and thinks about their future. And, and they want to be part of something. They want to feel part of something. So I think what we have to understand today is 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 what those key levers or triggers are for the youth today to drive um, their ambition forward. And I think um, to your point, it's not what we did years ago, but we have to stay ahead of it and we have to con continuously change to the workforce's, you know, changing desires, needs, and wants. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Our people and will always be our most important asset yeah. Uh, and you need to make sure that they know that. Yeah, it, it's yeah. critical that they know that. Well, there's no doubt about it, and 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 I think all the time. I, I know you guys do a tremendous job of recognizing your people, but you know, uh, many go every day of their their career without ever being recognized for the great work they do or what the contribution is Absolutely. to the business. Knowing the score, uh, understanding, you know, 
what happens if I perform in a certain manner and how that propels the business forward. I think it's just so important to, to have open lines of communication, as you said, understanding the score of the game and um, and what their uh, contribution means to the greater success of the entity. And I think that's, that's going to be super critical. You know, people, as we said, you know, training people and, and driving training and education of our people and, and educating them why it's important to, to continuously learn and continuously grow and, and how they're, their training will affect the performance of the, of the business. And, and, and in fact, what performance metrics are we trying to, to move, right? How their, their day-to-day -day activities will drive the key metrics that drive our business, which then drives profitability, right? And then that profitability enables growth. And to your point, Brad, about, you know, what you guys have done inside radar and, and scaling it, I have to believe that people are first. Without question. So our 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 strategy uh, is pretty clearly focused on culture. That's the foundation of of what we see as the most important part moving forward. Uh, obviously, because you know our ownership is focused on culture, uh, we're we, we're very passionate about people. We do care very deeply. We make sure that our teams know that. Um, you know, our industry did a real disservice to ourselves over the last fifteen or twenty years. The environments that we that we had young people in. And I mean, I, you know, I'm 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 young enough now that I remember what it was like 20 years ago. As a young person in this industry, it was a dog eat dog world. It was a tough place to work. Uh, it wasn't uh, necessarily open to the diversity that that is presented to us now with the talent. And so, you know, we may have adapted to the technology, but what we did is we created this this epic black hole of talent. Uh, and now, you know, we're playing catch up. Thankfully, there are. You know, a lot of initiatives are helping to bring young people back, uh, thankfully. But really, you know, we're scrambling now. We're all fighting over the same techs and an aging workforce. You know, you need to recognize talent. You need to recognize uh, dependability because those are the people that are going to be your top performers in 5, 10, 15 years. And you need to invest in them proactively. Uh, you need to find ways to encourage them. You need to find ways to drive their success and train them. And, you know, just recently I was at a, at a trade show at a, at a local trade school. And, uh, you know, we, it's easy for us to beat ourselves up and say there's no kids out there that want to be a, you know, a, a body technician or paint tech. But I, I don't think that's true. I think that there are a lot of good kids out there who are looking for an opportunity. And it's our job to promote an environment where they can come in, feel comfortable, recognize that there is some ability to have, you know, individuality perhaps that we need to massage our message uh you know the way i speak to a, a, a guy at the back end of his career is obviously very different than the way i speak to someone who's entering the, the business uh, and that's by design because it's the, the message needs to be delivered differently um i was i was actually very encouraged with what i saw at this trade school there's a lot of good kids out there and the one thing i said to them is you don't need to come in knowing anything we can train you we can invest in you. There are people out there who can teach you how to be a good technician. What you need to do is teach them that dependability counts, that showing up on time is important. Asking questions is important. Being, being thoughtful in your process is important. And when they do those things, it's relatively easy to recognize talent. And often the, the pool of talent within your business will, will encourage those people or take time to work with those people. If they do, don't do those things, well, they're probably not welcome in our industry. If they don't show up on time, I don't want them around. If they show up on time, I, I think that's a good start. So recognizing that, um, you know, yes, there is an investment in, in young people, but we need to invest in our in, in our attitude towards them as well. I think uh, you're touching on accountability. You know, it's an, we're, we're, we're in a uh, an interesting social space, right, in, in our world today. And things have changed so much and, and helping the youth understand what accountability means to a business also helps them understand how they can be accountable to themselves to be a better, better person for in, in all ways, quite honestly. You know, I, I think, uh, you know, the title here, people attitude over experience. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking a lot about how we hire or in, in the past have always looked for that a tech, as you said, but more and more today, I'm hearing store owners and I'm sure you guys are doing the same. You can tell us how you do it, but they're looking for attitude rather than experience. Now, so do you have the ability to step in here and truly make a difference? We'll teach you the skills, um, but can you be accountable? Are you going to be loyal? Can I depend on you to be here from, you know, the hours of seven to three, seven to four, whatever your, your open hours are. And, uh, and are you going to, are you going to 
work in our team? And are you going to drive um, that attitude and that culture that we expect? Um, I find that in today's in today's world, kids that come out of the schools, whether it's high school or, or what have you, may not have, may not have ever been exposed to that. So, how, how are you guys managing? You know that that key part of the education around accountability and and uh, dependability. Um, other than just you know a word from Brad, there must be a stronger culture that they have to be you know yeah brought yeah. into. I guess yes, definitely the 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 culture piece is when we talk about culture, we talk about our values. Now we have a certain set of values at our, at our group and we live and die by them every day. We make our decisions based on that. We hire people based on them. Uh, you know, we, we, we move on from people based on those values. Uh, we are, we are very passionate about making sure that we fulfill our obligation to follow through on our values. Now we are we're very vocal about them. We make sure everyone understands when they join us, how critical that stuff is. What, what I've seen in, in our business, in, in, and I can only speak for us, is that we have thankfully created an environment where there's there's there, we're benefiting from a gravity of attention now. You know, it's it's often I hear I can't find text. Well, you know, we haven't had that problem really. We we do we do you know geographically we face some challenges. There are you know some locations that are uh, you know maybe a little isolated, or some locations that perhaps um, you know a little little more expensive cost of living, and it's, you know have to you have to get a guy to travel in from out of town or whatever that looks like. But you know, effectively, what we've done is we've tried to engage our team so that they're selling us to the to the people that know they know in the industry. So we get a large amount of action simply from engaging our teams, making sure they know what we're looking for. And often when we sit down with with top techs that are looking to join our teams, the things that they're looking for are the intangibles. They're not looking for more money. They're not looking for more hours. They're not looking for a shinier box to work in. They're looking for, are you approachable? Are you open to change? Are you dependable in what the things you say that you're going to do? Are you engaging them on, on, do they buy, you know, the equipment, the training? Yeah. Are you investing in your people? And um, for us, it's, it, we've had a dramatic success in simply being a company that people want to work for. And definitely culture is super important and, and attracting the talent um, to be able to, to enable you to scale and continue to grow is, is super important. And that's all, you know, based and, and anchored in culture but how well, do you dave Sorry, i'll give ahead. you a quick story here Re recently sure. we hired sure, a technician ahead. outstanding technician you know we would consider him a 10 he's uh he's right in the middle of of his of his tenure yeah hyper trained hyper invested very passionate real car guy uh any to any technician would look to this guy's you know the future of our business and when we when we met with him he he literally said to me I've worked for a company for, for five years now. I actually, I enjoy it. I don't mind the people. I like, I like the environment, but I haven't seen anyone in management or upper level uh, operations or, or ownership. I haven't seen them in five years. I haven't seen them. They haven't yeah. even come to my shop. And this is a, this is a relatively large MSO. Yeah. And, and that's a real wake up call for, for me and Bill is we take that stuff very seriously. We recognize that what people are looking for is, is it, you know, an opportunity to to engage them. And when we hired this guy, after about three or four months, not only was he a top performer and he was he was ex exceeding his own goals as far as uh, productivity, he came to me and he said, I've seen you and Bill more in three months than I did the ownership of my previous company in five years. Yeah, yeah. So you have to be present. Your people are going to tell you what is wrong with your business, but you have to be there to listen. Amazing, uh, quite honestly, and and that ties really well into where we're going next here. Talking about how your people, your culture, your hands-on approach is driving performance, right? Yes. Because when you have invested people in your business, they care. Exactly, they, they care to drive performance. They care to you know, to to do better each and every day and improve themselves so that your business can do better because they feel part of it. They feel like they have a little bit of ownership. You know what I mean? It, yeah, it's for sure that ownership mentality. Um, uh, yeah, really, really cool story, actually, because we see it all the time. It doesn't matter what business we're in. We see these absentee owners that think that they can just walk away and things will just run take you doing. It doesn't actually happen. So it affects the people. Um, I know. I think I've had experience like that myself, but honestly, where you? Yeah, me too. For sure. Like, for sure. 
yeah, I wish to wish my boss would, you know, dig in here. Um, yeah. Uh, that's really interesting. Yeah, so we work, we do work very hard to make sure that nobody ever has to question where they stand. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's much easier to hold people accountable when they know that, you know, the default, we talk about the default, the positive in our business. So when we, yeah. when we engage our people, we always make yeah. sure they understand that even though the message might not be, you know, maybe, maybe less cozy than they had hoped. Um, yeah. That the reason that we're delivering that message is because we care about them. We care about our, yeah. our business and that they need to default to positive. So, you know, that's, that's the way we look at our engagement. Yeah, no, for sure. And being hands-on owners, you're, like you said, you're approachable, but um, you're setting accountability too. You're accountable for your business, right? Absolutely. Um, and that drives it down forward. And, and, you know, when you make mistakes, you're accountable. And from a leadership position that I'm in as well, I, I'm a, I'm the type of leader that wants to be in the trenches with my team, just like the sure. team will do. And I think it's so important for your, your team to see that. And they respect it. They appreciate it. They know you're you're in the fight with them. You know, really well, good. you know, especially at that management level, estimator, manager, production manager level, yeah. um, you know, those are roles that I have that I have uh, fulfilled in, in previous engagements. And I know what it's like to be in a bind. I know what it's like to have nowhere to turn, you know, whether you're having a challenge with an insurance company or, or a difficult customer, who, who knows what mm -hmm. it is. But, you know, when we say to our managers, I want you to call me and offload all that stuff onto me and I will be there and I will take care of that for you. You know, we mean it. And yeah. um, you know, is it is it always enjoyable to, to end up taking that stuff? No. But in the end, mm -hmm. I'm allowing our managers to focus on the things that they do best. And that's, you know, repairs cars, repair cars correctly and, and, and focus on customer service and that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, obviously the, the scalability piece allows us a little more opportunity to engage in that in that way. But, you know, even if you're if you're a single shop owner, um, you know, your people are looking to you to, you know, protect them, protect them in some respects. And and if we if we allow the environment to be such that they trust you to protect them, they will almost always uh, overachieve in some respects. Agreed, 100 percent. So let's let's get on to performance a bit and talking about where it all begins. Right. Sure. I think you'd agree with this. It starts it starts with a, a quality estimate. Right. Absolutely. You know, you know, accurate estimating, starting with DFR at the beginning and getting it all right. Um, and, and, and your parts sorting clean right through is starting right and finishing right. It's funny. Cause I remember when I was a tool and die maker apprentice, I had an old German, uh, tool maker that was, you know, mentoring me and he goes, you start right, you finish right. And that has stuck with me forever. And, and it's so true today in, in the collision business. And, and yeah. let's talk about that, Brad, talk about, you know, how you educate and, 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 and talk to your estimators and build that, you know, you know, I guess, move that culture into your estimating platforms sure. and, and your systems and how that rolls through your business. Sure. So, you know, we have, uh, you know, varying degrees of, of, uh, you know, disassembly for repair. Some are, some shops just quite frankly have more resources than others, but the reality is we try to teach our people that, you know, what we're trying to achieve at the beginning is predictability. We want to create as much predictability as possible. That's that's beneficial for the customer, obviously. It's extremely beneficial for the people who are working on the cars. Uh, you know, you, you want to have uh, a certain tempo that you can provide in your shops, and predictability is the key. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, it, there's always opportunities for mistakes, but the more that you work to create uh, a, a better process from the beginning, effectively what you're doing is you're you're creating an opportunity downstream to have less issues. Um, you know, complete disassembly for for uh, for repair is obviously a good component of that. Um, re proper repair planning. So, you know, we want to be focused on capturing all operations. Are you, you know, I'm sure there's there, there's 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 technicians out there who come to a to a supplementer or repair plan and say, "Oh, I'm ready for a repair plan," but it's a front end hit and the cooling system hasn't been disengaged. So it's like, you know, we really need to recognize that. One of the biggest grievances that I hear uh, from managers, estimators is, you know, so-and-so comes to me at the end and says, I need this. And effectively what they're doing is they're halting the process, they're they're tying up resources, and they're, you know, frankly, they're letting down the customer. So, you know, years ago, there was a, a, a very good shop that I, that I used to tour, and there was a sign on the wall, and it said, uh, why is there always time to do it twice and never time to do it right? And that <laughs> is... You know, the, I, I, I talk to my guys about that all the time. That is the crux of our business. In the whirlwind of what we face every day, 
trying to do more with less, trying to maximize your time. Effectively, what we're doing is we're we're cutting corners and we're we're just pushing the challenges down the road. Mm -hmm. um, so if you know if I could if I could recommend anything to a shop owner or a manager, I would say spending a little more time at the beginning is going to save you a lot of time at the end. And you know there are ways to start simple. You know maybe you maybe you uh, have an opportunity to recognize that there's a certain segment of your business that uh, consistently has missed operations. So front and rear collisions. Uh, you know bumper cover looks okay. You bring it in. Now the rebar is damaged. Hmm. Well, there might be there might be an opportunity to have a, a, a junior technician remove that bumper cover at the estimate. Engage your customer. Tell them I need thirty minutes or forty minutes or an hour, send them for a coffee, whatever that might, whatever might work for you. Uh, do the complete disassembly, reassemble the car, order all your parts. Now the vehicle shows up. Now the technician just is effectively just pushes the car through the repair process uh, versus these kind of start and stop uh, issues, which is, you know, there it's, uh, that's part of our business, unfortunately, but um, the more we can mitigate those stops, the more, the more, the more proficient and effective your teams will be in, in driving you know, day-to-day -day profitability. Can I, can I steal that line, that line where it's, there's always time to do it twice and never time to do it. Right. I like that. Absolutely. One. That's I, I, you know, I, uh, <laughs> it's, it's something that I think about a lot and, um, and it, and it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, uh, yeah, we, we just, we just went uh, through a lot of things there uh, that tie into the proper scheduling and making sure that that's clean too, because as much as, you know, you get your estimates right, you got to schedule properly, you know, not that old school methodology where you bring them in on Monday, get them in on Friday. You got to keep the, you know, the, the hours, you know, um, the production hours. Uh, yeah, we do. The, you know, we do try to talk to our teams yeah. about winning the day. So, you know, yeah. sometimes if we talk about a big number, um, yeah. And, you know, big numbers are exciting and they're and they're important for your teams to understand that you're moving in the right direction and you ought to have goals. Sure. But if you can get your teams to understand that you need to hit X amount of cars delivered per day and X amount of dollars delivered per day, that's a much more manageable, uh, yeah. often a much more manageable uh, capture point for an estimator or a manager to recognize. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, it, and it helps you with accountability. I mean, if you say to say to your team, I need X amount of cars delivered every day. Yeah. And and three or four days into the month, you're you're falling behind. Well, then you need to move your resources and you need to take the time to recognize what are your what are your choke points and you know why you're falling behind versus waiting until the, the tenth hour of the month and, and saying, Well, we didn't hit our mark. Yeah. That's yeah. that's not helpful to your teams. No, not at all. And thinking about accountability from within, accountability to each other inside, you know, the store or the shop. Um, that gets me to quality control, right? Because I always yeah. call it the, the internal customer. You know, Absolutely. When, you know, when you're handing a car off to the next department, it has to be signed off. Well, you're not going to sign off if, if it's crap work or, or you know, insufficiently done. So um, quality control is, is an incredible component to a high production store or a high production environment with a, with a strong culture. Let's talk a little bit about, you know, uh, how how you guys at Radar are managing quality control inside your facilities. Well, um, yeah, I mean, uh, we certainly, we don't have any magic bullet. Um, you know, we do have a lot, a lot of diversity in our teams, a lot of diversity in, in, you know, attitude or aptitude, whatever that might be. Yeah. Really what we, what we draw on is if we can create an environment where there's some ownership, uh, at, at, at transition points. So effectively what you're trying to do is, you know, catch things in the moment. So, you know, the painter is responsible when he accepts the job from the bodyman. There's a, there's a certain expectation of how that body work is completed. Mm -hmm. And if the painter accepts that work and it wasn't completed to what we would consider the, you know, the standard, well, that responsibility is owned by the paint tech. Because those, those handoff points are the, are the perfect opportunity to capture uh, deficiencies in your process. So, and, you know, there's, there's a lot of touch points. There's a lot of handoff points in a body shop. So, you know, it could be from, you know, the initial pre-wash to detail area to the disassembly, it could be assembly to the body, could be, could be a parts uh, a, a portion of that too. Um, if, it, it, the, the, if you build a strong culture where people take ownership and they have some, some semblance of, uh, of, of, of trust in their, in their teams, then those conversations are much easier to have. So, you know, when, when a person is not hitting the mark, you know, it's a relatively simple conversation. Yep. Hey, our expectation is when you deliver the product to X, 
that it needs to be at a certain level. And if you can't hit that, that's fine. Maybe you need more training. Maybe you're missing the mark. Fair. But it's it's uh, I say often to to the young guys that we hire, young gr- girls that we hire as well. Uh, whose job is it to keep the shop clean? And often, if it's a detailer, they'll say it's mine. And I will say, no, it's all of us. And it's the same thing with quality control is it's not the manager's job standing in the, in the finish at the, you know, in the rain at the finished product outside, look at the car. It's not just the body guy. It's not the painter. It's not the detailer. It's everyone. It's everyone. Yeah. It's amazing though, as you said earlier about culture and when you, when you have a strong culture in your team, quality control becomes a much easier part of the process because they're all accountable to each other. It's a great culture. You know, let's get, um, to the next the next key step it's at the heart of of every business and the reality is we're in business to make money right we just happen to fix cars for sure that's the reality of it and profitability today um how do i say this how profitability today is is more difficult to achieve with the outsides outside forces that are upon all of us right the cost of doing business has gone up we all know that so we have you know tension and 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 scrutiny around our margins our 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 everything costs more people yep. you know think about um, what it costs to rent or lease uh, equipment um products paint paper That's adhesives true. everything costs more and and you know what it, it's a sign of the times it is what it is However, we have to be smarter, right? We have to figure out how do we get paid for what we do. We have to figure out how do we refine our systems and our process to to be more efficient, to drive more money to the bottom line. You know, I think a lot about, you know, OE certifications and different opportunities to to drive more cars to the door and maybe get a few more dollars of labor rate, you know, Um I think about repair versus replace ratio. And I think about the impact that that's having and, and understanding our, our labor issues, right? With our people, maybe not as, as skilled as what they used to be. And we're in a more of a plug and play environment now with parts, right? But then understanding, doesn't matter what side of the coin you are on with the repair versus replace conversation, you have to be, know how to win it at the game. You know, you have to know the score, how you put the puck in the net, so to speak. So um, let's talk a bit, about, a bit about that with the radar sure. group what you guys are doing to, to drive profitability and take advantage of opportunities within your market and, and, and where you see it going. Sure. So it's easy to start this conversation saying, you know, beating up on the insurance company and saying that we, we need to increase our rates. And, and I'm, and that's, you know, that's a different webinar. I'm, I, you know, that's, that's a topic that we will all agree. There is, there is, there is some improvement to be made. No question. Yeah, love it. But I can't control the insurance company. We can control our decision making. We can't control our attitude. We can't control the processes in our business. We can't control how we evaluate profit. We can't control our 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 uh, engagement with our community. We can uh, our, our relationship with the, with the vendors. You know, there's a lot of ways to increase profitability that have nothing to do with rates. I mean, it's like. Um, just because someone throws more money at you, if you don't know how to manage that money, effectively all you're doing is having more money to mismanage. Yeah, so exactly. what what, what yeah. we're trying to achieve at our at our company is we 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 track our metrics, we have score, we have scorecards, we make sure that everyone understands that we're watching what's going on. Um we engage them when we're missing the mark, we we celebrate them when they hit the mark. We share as much as we can with our teams. We're a relatively open book uh, as far as, uh, you know, the financial metrics that help us continue to to uh, to grow our business. Um, one thing that we have seen recently is that, you know, effectively we're, we're only selling a couple things, right? We're, we're selling labor, we're selling parts, and we're selling materials. We want all of those metrics to be profitable. We have goals for all of them. You know, if, if one of them is lagging, well, it could drag the other two down. But what we try to do is create an environment where, you know, uh, for example, we've engaged some of our partners uh, where their where, where profitability in materials was a, a focus for us. There is some top performing locations and there's some less performing locations. And generally what we see is the top performers are the locations that have the more uh, senior, more proficient technicians. 
But if you engage the team and you show everyone across the board, here's a scorecard. Are you in the green? Are you in the orange? Are you in the red? We're, what we're trying to do is get people to engage in a, in a behavioral change independently. Nobody wants to be the bottom. Uh, you know, most people are relatively competitive. Um, if not, you know, sort of self-aware. Nobody wants to be the person that consistently underachieves versus their peer group. And by by recognizing the opportunity to focus people's attention on where do you stack up versus your peers, we get a really good positive engagement from that. I mean, I'm, I'm walking through shops and there's painters going, hey, when are you putting that report up? You know, I want to see if we get that lunch this month. And, uh, you know, did we beat so-and-so? That's, you know, that's part of growing your business and having some scalability that has yeah. been a huge benefit to us is, you know, an opportunity to engage people on a different level and yeah. to show showcase their, their celebrate their wins on the, versus their peers and, and yeah. recognize where we can do better. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's amazing to, to think about what healthy competition can do to fire up the engines. Right. I mean, I think you know, to your point, everybody's, a, this is very, very much competitive and, and, and they enjoy it. And if it's healthy and, mm -hmm. um, and you can drive further, you know, profitability or performance that ties into profitability, um, good on you. And, and quite honestly, I, I had that same experience. We did that uh, with the fixed auto stores down in, uh, in us, um, in Southern California. And, and, and it was great because we'd get together every quarter, we'd review the numbers and they'd all be cheering each other on or, or, you know, booing the winner. Cause it was a, it was a fun day out, but you know, the pizza was served and everybody had a good time and, yeah. and ultimately it drove the business forward. So, yeah. And, and, you know, as we've grown our business now, you know, geographically it's become much more hard, much more difficult to yeah. effectively get to everyone's store, you know, yeah. on the same day. Yeah. So we are really trying to, to build a system where we can manage, you know, effectively remotely by KPIs, uh, you know, maybe at a, at a 10,000 foot, thousand foot level. Yep. Uh, you know, obviously there still needs to be that, that uh, awareness, that engagement, uh, you know, boots on the ground stuff, but we, we do, we do set some metrics. We create some scorecards. Uh, we use a, 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 you know, a number of, of, of data sets that are, you know, pushed automatically in the morning to, 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 you know, keep partners in, in engagement there. And, and it, and it it has helped us understand how to manage uh, on data uh, mm -hmm. a little more than we were potentially managing, you know, boots on the ground style. So uh, yeah, you know, there there is a lot of technology out there that can help you um, understand not just what metrics to to trace, but also how to mine the data from from your management system. Yeah, very good, very good. And ultimately, profitability can create opportunity, right? I mean, when we think about profitability and what it can do for the the growth mindset or the growth mind uh, minded person or, or store owner, it can create opportunities, not only for them to add locations, which is an obvious one, but to, sure. to add capability and, and people and to grow their people. We talked about at the very beginning, a profitable business allows opportunity for the people to continue to grow their career. And I think, yeah. I think sometimes, um, some some of the employees may not see that they may be see it as more of a self selfish move for an owner to want to have more money in their pocket but again going back to communication and culture and setting the tone early and setting that good culture in people understand that they're going to get a piece of that action too in one way or another right opportunity comes and capabilities grow so you know with radar um you guys have you've been on a bit of a tear um and, and you're adding locations and and which is great but Talk about what you see from an expectation um, perspective when you when you add a new location, because I know we've had, we've we've been we've been down this road with you guys a couple of times, and it's really interesting to watch because many people like they want to pour fuel on the fire right away and and get this machine humming and on day one. And what is possibly missing is what you guys talk about, which is that slow and steady, mm -hmm. you know, put the foundation in. So let's let's talk a bit about that and and how sure. you guys look at sure. growth. Um, so in terms of growth, we look at growth, uh, you know, two sides to a coin. So effectively what we look at is internal organic growth within the location specifically, mm -hmm. uh, independent to the, to the overall uh, group. And then we look at acquisitions, uh, you know, acquisitions, obviously growth through acquisitions, uh, you know, presents some challenges also brings some benefits, but in terms of when we talk about growth, really what we're talking about is, um, mostly the organic, the internal growth. 
So our strategy, you know, we don't, we don't, uh, we're not some giant venture capitalist backed uh, company that has deep, deep pockets. So effectively what we're looking for is shops that are, you know, fit our strategy. Maybe they're underperforming or maybe there's less engagement culture. They have challenges. That's where we see the most opportunity for growth. So growth, um, it takes patience. It takes a lot of patience. Um, change is very hard. Uh, it, you know, it, it, we don't, we take it for granted sometimes that, you know, we go in and we acquire a store uh, and, and it's something we've done before. And we kind of know, we know what's coming effectively in some resorts. So we know that if we get, get in there and, and, and get the, get the company ex excited again and provide some new equipment and some training uh, that, you know, hopefully what's going to happen is that the ownership component, the cultural component will drive growth. Now that's always not enough. You have to engage your community uh, you have to engage your partners. You have to look at opportunities to specifically work within uh, that independent geographic region. So what works for us in Kelowna will likely not work for us in North Vancouver, uh, Langley and, and, and White Rock, very different as well. So you need to recognize, uh, you know, what, do you, what is that company potentially good at now? Where are your weaknesses? Uh, how can you how can you work on that stuff? Um, one thing that we do recognize is that the, the growth component, especially through acquisition, um, it will, it will expose some of your strengths and all of your weaknesses. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you don't have a good culture and you want to go buy a bunch of shops, all of the shops will have a poor culture. If you have poor process, um, you will be exposed with poor process. So, a lot of this stuff can be can be worked on as you go, but really what you need to do is identify, um, you know, pretty early on, what is your strategy? What are your strengths as a business? Lean into that and then engage your team to understand that growth is good for all of us. Yeah. You know, the sustainability of any business is based on, you know, overall profitability. We need to be able to pay our bills. Yep. We need to be able to reinvest in our company. We need to buy new equipment. We need to train our people. Um, we do have some OEM uh, integration uh, that, you know, there's some pretty significant capital investments that come along with that stuff. And in, in order for us to do those things, we need to be able to have a sustainable, profitable business. Yeah. And there's yeah. nothing wrong with telling your people why you need to make money. You need to make money so that we can all continue to grow and yep. that's individual yep. growth or company growth or acquisitions. And, you know, I hope we've done a pretty good job of that. I don't, um, there's no magic bullet. No, every no. team is different. Every person receives a message differently. Yeah. Remember, I think, I think you're, I think you're segueing into a really interesting spot here because when I, when I hear you talking about, you know, um, communicating internally and educating your team and, and different things like that, but you're also getting education too, right? You're getting feedback from them and, and, and what, what it means to them and how they can be a bigger part of it. But one of the other key things is learning from your peers, right? And we, we, mm -hmm. Car Star Canada's um, developed this program over the last few months called Restore the Star and, and the Radar Group's part of that. And, and you were at our first inaugural yep. meeting and, um, and, and learning from your peers about their experience, what they've done, how they're how they're driving performance. What what are the you know unique things they're doing to to capture more opportunity or what have your people or, or whatever it is and, and talking about growth or KPIs. And um, Restore the Star has truly brought eighteen of the brightest minds in our network together, right? All high performers and maybe different categories, right? No. Not all they're not all perfect, but they they've all got tremendous experience, and that we feel will be the the engine that drives our business forward. And, and, and we're very thankful for the radar group to be part of it. Let's talk about that for a little, a second, right? You, you were at the first meeting we had in Toronto. Our next one's coming up in Miami at the end of November. And let's talk about your experience at Restore the Star and, and what you feel um, you're taking away, but also giving and, and where do you think it's going to go? Well, I mean, we were certainly very grateful to be uh, included in the inaugural meeting. Um, <laughs> I know, you know, for me anyways, there was a time in my career where I was I was in rooms with people who had a you know a, a, a lot of great things to say. I was either lucky enough or whatever that might have been. Someone saw some some ability in me, 
And and I know it was over those quiet moments um, in, in a little more structured setting where you can you can really get the guts of what people are trying to get through. Uh, Restore the Star specifically, you know, there is some outstanding operators. We're, you know, growth mindset, but not just growth for the sake of growth. Growth because they feel like they can, you know, they can be a benefit to their communities or they can they can be a benefit to their employees. And I mean, I... I came away from that meeting with a whole bunch of good ideas and I've already, I've already been engaging with other members of that, uh, the, of the participants. We've already taken a number of initiatives that were, that were exposed to me during that meeting at other locations. And we've now moved them into our processes and, um, you know, varying results. But the whole point of that is that, uh, when you're in a group, like restore the star, uh, that diversity of, of, uh, of, 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 uh, of thought, the diversity of, of, of process, you know, there's a, there's a lot of neat stuff in there. And, and sometimes you don't recognize that maybe you're not doing something that, uh, or maybe, maybe you're doing something that could be beneficial to someone else or vice versa. So, yeah. um, you know, having that ability to engage peer to peer, I mean, that's really where that's, that's the secret sauce. Um, yeah. I think, I think the idea of it really is to truly rise all boats with the tide, right? Absolutely. We're going to share yeah. best practices. We're going to share how we do things. We're going to share opportunity. Mm -hmm. We're going to, I've never seen so much engagement across, you know, the store owners, the MSOs that are in that group. People are traveling to see each other's operations and what they're mm -hmm. doing. It's, it's, it's such a, such an amazing, cool moment that, you know, I guess back a while when we, we dreamt this up, we, you know, I don't think we thought we could get off the ground as quickly as we did because yeah. We have to bring value as well, you know, from a from a corporate perspective. But truly, the the, the franchise owners that are in that room have just taken it and begin to run. And, uh, and truly Dave, amazing for me. The the, the most in, the thing I came away from the most from that meeting yeah. was, um, you know, it's 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 great to be amongst your peers where you can you know you can you can lean into some of the challenges and know that you're not alone. Yeah. But really, it's the humility of these these exceptionally talented outstandingly intelligent people um that's the key is they, they, they you have to be humble enough to accept that you don't know what you're doing all the time and that you're open yeah. to engagement <laughs> well said um, if yeah. you if, you know if you think you you know it all you're probably not welcome in a group like that because i guarantee you all 18 of us openly admitted that we have no idea some days what we're doing and we <laughs> lean on each other and we just work through it and we got up in the morning we have a good attitude and um you know it's exciting to see that that is that is something that this industry has done very well. It's got a, uh, some of the, the brightest minds are the most humble people mm -hmm. and they will, they will openly tell you their secrets. If you just take a moment to ask. Yeah, truly, truly a moment where the power of the network is the network. It's one of my favorite yeah. lines and, and it's true. And we were witnessing it. Um, let's get to uh, wrap this up a little bit and, and sure. back to what we started with, you know, uh, educate and train the people. They will drive performance performance drive profitability and ultimately that'll drive growth in, in, in many different ways. So um, appreciate it, Brad. That was an amazing fireside chat. In my opinion, I, th I think we could keep kept going on for hours here, which is completely what would for happen sure. probably with a cold beverage in our hand, quite honestly. Um, Next time. Let's, let's hand it back over to you for some Q and a and, and, and see what we get. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so, wow. Thank you guys. My, my mind's spinning over here. I've got so many notes written down and, um, like you said, I could listen to you guys talk for hours. Uh, you don't need, I don't need a cold beverage in my hand to listen to you guys chat about all the different things you've got. <laughs> I'm getting thirsty, about. so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, and I know the Restore the Star meeting, our team was uh, able to be there as well. And like you said, Brad, um, I think it's really inspirational. And you said it too, Dave. Uh, it's inspirational to see you guys, everyone come together and share ideas. I mean, Dave, you're saying people are going to check each other's facilities out just to see the ideas in action and how they can be implemented in their own facility. And as you said, it shows the power of a network and we're all in the same business here. Uh, we're not, and we're all facing the same challenges, Brad, you touched on that at one point too. Like we're yep. all in the same boat, stealing people from other people for a lot of, in a lot of cases in a lot of markets. So um, lots of ideas shared here. Uh, if anyone has any questions, fire it up. But um, I wanted to touch on uh, Brad, you said at the beginning of the conversation, uh, the anecdote about your tech who had noted previous manager's absence um, on the shop floor. And then that's what was really stood out with your market. So like, tell us how, with, sorry, your business. So 
tell us how your team makes an effort to engage with staff. Is it, is it something that comes consciously to you guys or is, how has that worked into your culture that it's just, you know, we're just on the um, all the time. Yeah. I mean, th thankfully for, for our company, it's something that we, you know, we kind of, we're very aware of, we're hyper aware of. Um, we, we love walking into a shop and getting that, you know, feeling like your team is engaged and the music's playing and everyone's having a good time. Um, you know, some things are a little more nuanced perhaps, but we are very honest with our teams that if we're, you know, if there's something missing, we ask them, what do we need? What are we looking for here, guys? You know, some of them might say, don't go, don't get a heavy hitter tech. What we really need is a third year apprentice. We could really use that guy. So I think there's a, there's a position for engagement and not just that, but if you say to your team, Hey guys, you know, we need a tech or whatever that might be. They might know someone down the road that is interested in joining the company. Um, we've had great success with just having our teams basically self-recruit. And, um, you know, we have a number of people in our company currently that, um, that, uh, you know, if, for instance, our Kelowna location, well, we started with one, you know, one very important person who was our manager there. And the next thing you know, now he's drawing in talent uh, from from the uh, the region. So, you know, if you engage your people and you ask them, first off, what do you think we need? You know, we're missing the mark. We need to get one more car a day through the through the paint booth. What what can we do to support you? What kind of resources do you need? Do you need more people? Um, you know, there's 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 lots of calculations you can do uh, to see if you if you're if you're staffed appropriately. Um, but really, what it is is just if your people understand. You know, here's the thing: is if you go to your team and you say, "Hey, we need to do X amount of hours," and they're like, "Hey, I'm I'm tapped out," well, that that's good. We see that as a benefit because that means that they, they'll be much more engaged. If we bring a person in and they o openly admit that they need help, uh, that additional person will not be stepping on anyone's toes. Sometimes if a shop does that and, and sticks a heavy hitter in a shop, and we've seen this before, uh, it can isolate, it can create a, a cultural issue. Um, so yeah, your team likely has a lot of good answers. They even potentially have some people that could join your team, you know, effectively pretty quickly. You just need to engage them in a way that makes them want to bring them on side. Yeah. So um, it's an interesting approach. I think, um, in my experience, you know, it's, it's not to say it for lack of a better term, but bottom up approach, a lot of the best answers are found on the shop floor. Exactly. Uh, don't want to ever be that company that, is a push down approach. This is, it's coming from the, you know, from the boardroom down, that's never going to drive success. I think, you know, inclusion um, in, in the, in the greater decision-making and supporting the business moving forward is, is incredibly important. So great, great and, point. And, the, and the, the safety to speak their mind. I, right. I guarantee you, if you go and call a team meeting in your shop right now, you're going to get what's called bobblehead syndrome where people are just kind of, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. you don't, yeah. that's not helpful. <laughs> It's not, it, you need to engage your people so they feel safe to speak their mind. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes they're going to say things you quite frankly don't want to hear, or maybe you already know them and you just don't, you know, don't want to admit it. But when, when you do that, when you create a safe space, you know, safety is one of our core values. And it's easy to think safety in a physical sense, but we are much more focused on safety in a, in a mental sense. Uh, safety to speak your mind, safety for an environment where you feel welcome, that kind of stuff. So if you do those things, I guarantee you, your team will slowly but surely start to tell you what's wrong with your business. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Not lots to unpack there too, but I like, I'm interested to hear how, I mean, you speak to, you're very transparent with your team. You want them to be transparent with you, but we talked about KPIs and things. How much do you tell your team about, you know, we talked about performance and them, you know, competing about, uh, competing with other shops in the network to try and uh, win that pizza party or win that special lunch or that special activity, whatever it may be. Sure. How transparent are you guys with your metrics and how you guys are actually doing at the core of the business with your team? Uh, we are very transparent. Now we have to be, be conscious of the fact that uh, Painter isn't going to really need to know, yeah. you know, more than his focused attentions. But yeah, we're very transparent. With our managers, we need to recognize that there are some things that we that we do keep to ourselves and that there's a reason for that, but we we're, we're pretty open. Our KPIs, we, we, we have a data set that gets pushed out to our managers every morning. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that we call that our scorecard. It, it basically, what it does is it just pulls the bandaid off. We don't want any surprises. Sure. 
And uh, it makes those conversations a lot easier to have if managers, uh, you know, maybe not hitting the mark this month and we're, you know, a few weeks in, we can proactively have that conversation versus waiting until the end and, and there's nothing we can do about it. So um, we are pretty forthright with our KPIs, uh, but we're, you know, we're very careful about making sure that we're sharing the right information with the right person with the right people. in the right role. But as far as our managers and estimators and, and production managers, they, you know, they have a pretty good understanding of where we are every month. Uh, we are very clear with our goals. We have certain things that we are, are non-negotiables um, and that we expect them to hit those those targets. But um, yeah, there's no sense in uh, in keeping everything yourself because it's, uh, you know, the collision industry, much like any business, it's the ultimate team game. Mm -hmm. It really is. Uh, you know, I don't want a team full of the same type of people. I want a team that is diverse enough that there's a, you know, some semblance of creativity and um, uh, innovation that comes from that. There's also the ability to have these honest conversations where, you know, so-and-so is doing something. The other team should be able to say, knock it off, or you need to do better. Um, but yeah, we're, pr we're pretty honest with what's going on. I know many years ago, a mentor of mine said to me, he was always cautious to post the, the metrics for financials. Because, uh, you know, if, if your shop's doing really well, then the, the, the company's going to come, everyone wants, wants to raise. And if it's doing poorly, they're all going to look for a job. I, I think that we're kind of, you know, at a point now where if you're honest with people uh, and you create an environment where they feel safe to speak their mind and you hold them accountable and you get really, you just get out of their way, um, they're going to they're gonna do what's needed. I mean, we try to... As much as we want to have processes across uh, our our network that are there's some symmetry there, we also give people uh, some ability to be flexible. You know, we're judging people on results. Uh, we often say this is a results based business, and so you know, I'm not so concerned sometimes um, with the with the real the real nitty gritty details because mm -hmm. you know if the customers are accounted for properly and they're taken care of. And we're doing safe and proper repairs and we're following OEM procedures and everyone's in a good mood. Well, then that's that's a that's a big deal to me. That's that's the result. So uh, and that effectively will continue to grow the business. So, um, yeah, we're pretty forthright. You know, we, we try to have as much openness as we possibly can. For sure. I think we'll have, we have time for one more quick question here. I've got a question from the audience asking about AI. Um, how do you see mm -hmm. AI technology coming into play in the next couple of years, uh, particularly in the estimation process or how it may be used to communicate with the end customer? Is there a general plan in place or already to implement? Yeah. So, you know, it's funny. AI was something that I was, uh, was thinking about and I didn't get a chance to speak on it. But yeah, I uh, AI is going to be a game changer uh in the next three to five years. I mean, um, we are in the real infancy stage uh, with AI, but the things that are going to happen are going to happen so fast. Um, there, There is a significant opportunity to use AI. The challenge is right now, in order to build the AI programs, there is a relatively high cost to that. Now, mm -hmm. we have met with uh, programmers that d develop these AI processes. And, uh, you know, there's things like estimate scrubbing, uh, scheduling, customer engagement, after hours engagement. These are all things that uh, right now might be a little more complicated, a little more costly to, to, to initiate. But I guarantee you over the next, you know, 12 to 18 months, you're going to see some AI stuff that is going to, you yeah. know, frankly, it's going to blow everyone's mind. And a yeah. lot of the stuff that the AI is going to help us with are, it's going to take uh, a junior person and make them more proficient. It's going to help with your customer engagement. Uh, it's going to, it's going to automate a lot of the things that quite frankly, uh, you know, take a lot of time and, and it's going to, it's going to speed that stuff up. So um, AI in our industry uh, in the next five years is going to be, it's going to be a game changer. <clears throat> so yeah, be ready and educate yourself and uh, do not be adverse to change because it's going to happen so fast. If you don't, if you don't take that stuff to heart, your your competition is going to absolutely blow you out of the water. Yeah, no, I'll add a quick one to that, Allison. And from a corporate perspective at Carstar, we're evaluating the AI platforms in the estimating space right now, whether it be True Claim, Tractable, Tractable, or Solaris products. 
Um, we're evaluating them all from a national perspective to see how we can implement and, and what we what we can do as a partnership with them. So definitely at play and definitely at front of mind and, and big conversations on a daily basis right now. So um, we have quite a few pilots going on in our in our in our stores across the country. And um, with those results and, and the feedback from that will help us make some decisions going forward from a national perspective. Perfect. Yeah, I think yeah. we uh, might have just set the stage for uh, another webinar with that last question there. So thanks for that audience. <laughs> yeah, that's a whole <laughs> webinar by itself, I think. Yeah. yeah. How does AI play into everything we just talked about? Yeah. Okay, yeah. but that's right. Yeah, we're um, thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in today. Sorry, we went a little bit over our time here, but great conversation with Brad and Dave here, giving us their insights on profitability, growth, and uh, becoming an MSO, growing your, even not even MSO, just scaling your business and growing uh, to achieve your dreams. So um, your dreams, your team's dreams and everything. So uh, thank you guys so, so much. Cannot thank you enough. And we'll um, see you all next time on our next Open Dialogue. Great. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone. Bye, Bye everyone. for now.